So the heroine of Bernie's um, first novel is confronted with what seems to be primarily a legal problem, how to recover an identity and an inheritance of which she has been unlawfully deprived and the terms lawful, legal, uh, unlawful are recurrent uh, throughout the novel. The definition of law given by Johnson's dictionary, and this is the first quotation in your handout, uh, stresses two main aspects. The first is the idea of a public rule, um, uh, publicly established as a rule of justice. That is to say, a universal rule applying to all the inhabitants of a nation. The second aspect is that these rules are set, uh, which the repetition of terms such as established, fixed, makes clear. These two aspects work together when we consider that the law constitutes a framework determining or establishing or setting how each citizen of a nation is supposed to behave. As Peter de Bola explains, and this is the second quotation on your handout, for writers on law in the period, the law might be considered as an envelope within which human action occurs. It invisibly surrounds us and determines what may or may not be done, said, made, exchanged, purchased, inherited, destroyed. So all the fields of human activity and life are regulated by the law, and this, of course, does not only apply to the 18th century. The conception of the law in 18th century England is highly indebted to John Locke, whom one of the most famous writers on law in the period, William Blackstone, often refers to in his commentaries on the laws of England. So I'm now about to sum up uh, drastically uh, law's theory. Uh, where there is no law, there is no freedom, says Locke, uh, much better than what I just said. Um, the, the, subject relinquishes, the legal subject relinquishes part of his freedom to act as he pleases to the law in order to guarantee this freedom. So it's a system of exchange uh, upon which the social contract, or what will be known as a social contract, is based. So my purpose here is obviously not to discuss Locke's theory or other legal aspects of the century. I would like to reflect briefly on this legal subject uh, in the light of what it means to be a legal subject if you are a woman, so its relevance or the non-relevance uh, to femininity and eventually to writing, uh, through a presentation of woman's place in, or as it turns out, largely out of uh, the law, in Evelina. In Blackstone's commentaries, the subject is recurrently designated by the pronoun he and is posited as male. The legal subject, whose freedom is guaranteed by the law, is consistently gendered male, as the first entry on justice in Johnson's dictionary makes clear, uh, this is the third quotation on your handout, the virtue, this is the first sub-entry, and the entry on justice is much longer, the first sub-entry, the virtue by which we give to every man what is his due. Now the ambiguity here lies in the tension between the universal and the gendered or specific meaning of the word man, suggesting that justice may be taken to apply to men only, which is corroborated by the fact that another of the meanings of justice is expressly reserved to men, being a justice meaning being a judge. And only men could be judges. Blackstone makes this explicit, and he takes it one step, step further, sorry, when he addresses the lectures, which will become his famous commentaries on the laws of England, to, I quote, gentlemen and scholars to, I quote again, the gentlemen of England. So his commentaries are addressed to gentlemen, uh, an audience of landed proprietors of upper-class males at Oxford. So the law as impartial rule of justice, as universal public rule, thus becomes an ideological transfiguration of male class values which aims uh, at safeguarding the power and wealth of a few privileged men, or patriarchs, posited as the only real legal subject. It is worth remembering in such a context that women like Bernie or Evelina have no legal existence in the 18th century, or hardly any, um, especially in the status of a young woman, unmarried. Uh, not only are they denied the right to vote, and so they cannot choose who will decide on the nation's laws, 
and of course they cannot be lawmakers. But they are considered as perpetual minors under the law, as children under the authority first of their fathers and then of their husbands. The wife's status, as famously defined by Blackstone, is particularly telling in this respect. This is quotation number four. The husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection and cover, she performs everything. Such a definition evokes and parallels Locke's theory of exchange with the patriarchal family mirroring patriarchal society as a subject relinquishes his freedom to the law so that the law guarantees this freedom, so a wife yields her legal existence to her husband, a being, writes Blackstone, and in exchange, this husband consolidates, his very word, and that being, and is responsible for her actions. Now, the problem with such a conception is made dramatically clear and evident in the first pages of Evelina. If women like Caroline Evelyn have no option but to relinquish their legal existence when they marry, men, on the other hand, have the freedom not to perform their part of the bargain and to withdraw their protection as they wish, and as Berman did, leading, ironically, to the literal suspension of Caroline's very being, in other words, her death. This example represents just one of the many ways in which Evelina exposes the failings of the patriarch's law, although it is probably the most extreme and it anticipates on the greatest Gothic novels and especially Radcliffe's. David Punter thus recognizes, I quote, that part of what is happening in the Italian is a representation of women's experience of a very foreign, male-dominated world. But he contrasts it with, I quote, Bernie's response to that situation, which is exactly the opposite. So according to David Punter, Bernie's response is to reside in an absolute faith in the justice of legal process. And David Punter adds in a note, certainly in Evelina, the law appears to be regarded as above reproach. Now, I both agree and disagree with David Punter, as I'm I'm now about to uh, explain. Um, I agree because no character ever voices the slightest criticism against the laws of England in the novel. Quite the contrary, as we will see. But I disagree because a close reading of the novel reveals that this point of view is only valid if we consider the law as being, in fact, entirely irrelevant to whatever happens to the characters of having no bearing whatsoever on the characters' lives and doings in spite of the apparent role it plays in the novel. And characters like Lady Howard, Mr. Villars and Madame Duval refer regularly to what is or what is not lawful, think of going or speak of going to court, uh, etc., It is true that in Caroline Bellman's case, the law itself is not directly at fault. Bellman has destroyed the evidence of their marriage, which had no witness, and he can therefore deny that it ever took place. So, at first sight, the blame lays on the husband, a fallible man, not on the legal institution of marriage, and the two are dissociated. The abstract, impersonal, public universal law, which stipulates that a husband should protect his wife, remains above reproach, while the individual may choose to disregard this law in a private context and he can be blamed for it. But as I have already hinted, the uh, uh, very universal and abstract character of the law is to say the least debatable. More deeply, as I will now develop, uh, the legal context of the period assimilated the husband to a lawmaker and law enforcer, associating rather than dissociating human, sorry, man or husband and law, so that through the individual, it is the entire legal system which may well be targeted. The subjective and personal character of the law appears clearly in Evelina. Although Bellman's attitude is portrayed as criminal, not least by himself, and he uses the word murder, he also refers to his crimes, um, no redress can be obtained through legal process for Caroline or for Evelina, 
whom he has deprived of her lawful inheritance and identity, as I said. No help is afforded the victims in the public sphere of the law. As Lady Howard remarks in another context with unintentional irony, quotation number five, this is not a country where punishment is inflicted without proof, indeed. The ending of the novel is happy, not because the patriarch has been legally punished for, his ver for the very real crimes he committed, but because he has decided on his own free will to make private amends for them. And this uh, is pointed out by Mrs. Selwyn, quotation number six, Half uh, his prodigious delicacy for the little usurper is the mere result of self-interest, for while her affairs are hushed up, silence, uh, uh, Sir John's, you know, are kept from being brought further to light. In other words, in other words, one man's subjective and private choice replaces the law's supposedly objective, or at any rate, abstract and public decision. The general impersonal rule of justice is made to depend upon the very personal will of an individual actuated by his conscience or lack thereof and by nothing else. Like Godwin's Caleb Williams and less explicitly but just as clearly as in Radcliffe's novels, Evelina reveals that nothing can oppose the patriarch's word because it is the law. Bernie's novel dramatizes what Johnson's definition of the law and of justice hinted at or what Blackstone's commentaries made plain. Because the law belongs to the public sphere, because it defines or determines what the public sphere is, because it is made by upper-class men for upper-class men, it is thoroughly alien to women, who, as we saw, are both linguistically and theoretically excluded from the definition of what a legal subject is. And this is what Evelina feels instinctively when she recoils in horror from the thought of a lawsuit against her father without actually explaining her refusal. She gives no explanation except, I won't go, I'm not going. I'm a woman. Uh, and this is also what Mr. Villas points out when he explains his own refusal with the explanation which provided the uh, title to my presentation, A Child to Appear Against a Father. What ought to depend on the public and impersonal process, we're talking about indicting a criminal who has wronged an innocent girl, and even two innocent girls, is turned by Villers into a private and personal affair in which the child woman would confront her father, patriarch. So the legal pair, culprit and victim, is replaced by the family pair, child, uh, father and child. In the patriarchal scheme of things, Villars is, is in fact suggesting that Evelina's arraignment of her father would be tantamount to rebellion against the state and even possibly to blasphemy. I mean, after all, Villars is a reverend, and elsewhere in the novel, the name of a father is called Revered. Uh, and this would place her, and not Belmont, in the position of the guilty party. Villars justifies his opposition to the lawsuit, uh, quotation number seven, by claiming that a plan so public is totally repugnant to female delicacy, female delicacy which supposedly prevents a woman from appearing publicly in a court of law. Delicacy being considered by conduct book writers as belonging naturally to a woman, a woman is a woman if she is delicate, as a result, the very nature of womanhood bars women from the realm of the law, because they are women. It is not only that a lawsuit would be doomed to fail, since Bauman's word would have more weight than his crimes. The real issue here, in fact, is that the law is construed as being foreign, alien to women. And this alienation is exactly what Madame Duval experiences, ironically, no other character in the novel seems more confident in the justice of the law, mm. nor more willing to trust to legal process, a faith she expresses at her very first appearance in the novel, quotation number eight. Uh, I'll promise you, I'll get you put to prison for its usage. I'm no common person. I'll go to justice fielding about you. Not only is she intent on initiating the lawsuit in order to recover Evelina's rightful inheritance and force Sir John to acknowledge his daughter, she explicitly expresses her intention of going to court on two other separate accounts against two other men, 
threatening first to go to law in order to challenge Willis's custody of Evelina, and then to seek redress from justice after being assaulted by Mervyn, which she is prevented from doing for two reasons. First, Mervyn has rendered her unfit to be seen. And there's a famous quotation uh, on your handout, number nine. He has deprived her of her public appearance, casting her into a ditch, ruining her gown and hair. And the quotation concludes with, she hardly looked human. Quotation number 10, I can't go out, says Duval, because I've got no curls, I, uh, so he'll be ex escaped before I can get to the justice to stop him. To avoid being seen in such a pathetic slash ridiculous, depending on who's looking at her state, she must hide in the carriage before hiding in her bedroom. As Julia Epstein observes, quotation number 11, it is not primarily physical injury that is here sustained, though the physical attack is severe enough, but the violation of appearance. The captain has literally undressed her. Captain Mervyn has removed her from the public sphere where justice resides and has rendered her not merely symbolically naked, but fundamentally private and forcibly enclosed as well. So that was the first uh, reason. And the second reason is that when Duval is at last able to go out and stand before a judge, which she does, she receives, uh, quotation 12, very little encouragement to proceed in her design, for she has been informed that as she's neither heard the voice nor saw the face of the person suspected, she will find it difficult to cast him upon conjecture and will have but little probability of gaining her cause unless she can procure witnesses of the transaction. Once again, the judge and the law he implements are not at fault. This is not a country where punishment can be inflicted without proof. Duval's unsuccessful dealings with the law parallel on a comic mode what Caroline's story made explicit on the tragic one. The law is forbidden to women, even the victims of men whose crimes remain unpunished. And the full irony of Duval's situation comes from the fact that she was assaulted en route from the House of Justice Tyrrell, where she was led, she thought, to intercede on behalf of a man, Monsieur Dubois. She appears to be punished precisely for trusting in the law, for intruding on a field where she does not belong. Since Evelina has little sympathy for Madame Duval, we may be led to infer that Bernie is here endorsing this restriction of women's place to the private sphere, that she is following a conservative agenda in agreement with Villas's. Madame Duval had it coming, so to speak, for thinking of taking the law against three father figures, Villas, uh, Mervyn, and uh, Belmont. So Bernie would be abiding by the law of the father. And the father's rule is mentioned in the poem, which was uh, evoked um, earlier today. Uh, were it not for three facts. First, the impeccable Lady Howard agrees with Duval about the lawsuit against Belmont, and she raises disturbing questions about Villas' specificity in the matter, and these doubts are never entirely dispelled. Second, an interesting parallel may be drawn between Duval's calls for justice in a fictional court of law and Bernie's own appeal to the justice of the, I quote, magistrates of the press, from whom she carefully conceals her femininity in the paratex and the, the dedication to... Uh, uh, so the book, in fact, opens on a call for justice and Bernie knew very well that she was far less likely to benefit from the critics' I quote, impartiality, justice, and judgment, and these, these three terms recur in her dedication, if these critics were aware that they were reading a woman's text. So it is Duval and not Villas that Bernie echoes here, submitting Evelina the novel to public justice, even though Evelina the character will not appear in court. Bernie is here implicitly refusing the double standard prevalent at the time, a time when whores were considered guilty, but not their clients, for instance, and that guilty state, writes Evelina about uh, the prostitutes. Uh, incidentally, this double standard is taken for granted. James Fordyce thus writes blithely that, quotation number 13, the world, I know not how, overlooks in our sex a thousand irregularities which it never forgives in yours. It does not wonder how, I wonder not. And thirdly, and more scathingly, perhaps, the novel draws several times a clear-cut distinction between 
the law and justice in the sense of ethics, uh, a distinction which is made by Orville at the end regarding Polly Green, uh, number uh, 14, though not in law, in justice, he says, she ought always to be treated as the daughter of Sir John Belmont. So this opposition hinges on two of the meanings of the word justice, the character of what is fair on the one hand, ethics, and the legal process of law on the other, and these two meanings never coincide in Evelina. Not one of the characters guilty of actionable, and the term um, occurs in the novel, of actionable acts, is legally punished for their crimes, and everyone conspires in Mervyn's case to cover for him, his wife, mother-in-law, daughter, Evelina herself, so the women unite to prevent a patriarch from being punished for assaulting another woman. That the outrageous Madame Duval should be the only character, with the possible exception of Lady Howard, who puts absolute faith in the justice of legal process, while everyone, everyone, everyone else pays no attention to the law, avoids it, or makes sure that it will not be rendered, is surely not the best means of portraying a law which is above reproach. All the more so, as it may be argued, and I am about to argue, that someone does come on trial in Evelina, and that someone is the innocent heroine herself. In a rewriting of a trial scene at the beginning of the novel, in which the legal subject subtext is transparent, Lovell accuses Evelina of being guilty of ill manners before pretending to deny that he is making any such accusation. And uh, this is quotation number 15. Uh, far be it, be it from me to accuse the lady for having the discernment to distinguish and prefer the superior attractions of your lordship. The legal motive is taken up shortly afterwards during a conversation between the two men, uh, uh, which Evelina does not uh, witness, in which Lovell quickly shifts from, uh, this is quotation number 16, from censuring Evelina's behavior, in other words, acting as a prosecutor, to asserting his right and capability to judge against Sir Clement's defense of Evelina in absentia. So she's being tried in absentia. Uh, in, in a passage not quoted, Evelina refers to Sir Clement as her defender, a term which has, um, uh, according to Johnson, a, a legal uh, connotation. Uh, it's an, an advocate in the legal sense. And so Lovell affirms his position as a judge twice in, in this uh, particular excerpt um, in bold character. Uh, Lovell, who it will be revealed later, is a member of the House and thus theoretically a lawmaker endowed with legislative power, thus places himself in a position to condemn or absolve a young woman. But we cannot forget that Evelina's judge is also in the first place her accuser and the one who makes the law by which she will be judged resuming the idea that justice is at best difficult to achieve for women and it is dependent on a man's word, man's decision, at worst that justice is absolutely denied them, and hinting furthermore, as I will um, uh, develop later, that judgment and accusation are one and the same thing where women are concerned. Uh, masculine discourse in the novel uh, reflects uh, no, other examples I've developed elsewhere, but we can come back to that in the questions if you want, would like to. Uh, masculine discourse in the novel reflects back onto Evelina the image of a criminal, uh, particularly with uh, Sir Clement. Her very innocence becomes in itself the sign of her guilt, and just one example, the most blatant example of this process, which can be found in the Bristol poem, uh, quotation number 17. Uh, it turns Evelina not into a thief, uh, she, Orville calls her a soul stealer, she steals the soul, uh, but this poem turns her into a murderer. Anvil to her power unknown, artless strikes and conscious kills. In the context of, the novel, uh, of a novel where the law is so often referred to and where the importance of acting by the rules cannot be too highly stressed for women, whom conduct book writers urge to constantly regulate, determine, set um, uh, th their behavior, their desires, and themselves. 
It is significant that Evelina should be named after Eve in a, in a context in which names, uh, of a novel uh, uh, in which names play such a prominent part too. It is significant that Evelina should be named after Eve, the first woman supposed to be the first lawbreaker in Western history. Uh, Feminist thinkers, in particular, have shown how uh, the convergence of theological and political discourses uh, has led women to think, of, to think of themselves as guilty beings, as outlaws by nature. I am a woman uh, of many sins, uh, uh, and so I am an outlaw. And to feel shame for being women, because as a woman, I am guilty, and so I ought to be ashamed of being a woman. Uh, writers such as Hélène Sixou have particularly explored the gendered relationship to the law propounded by the Bible and by Christian civilization. Eve defying the father's law and Adam obeying, at least until seduced, of course, by women to transgress. In extreme fidelity, in fact, Sixou uh, opposes Eve and Percival. Percival, who obeys the decree of the law uh, at the court of the Fisher King and um, with dire consequences. Uh, so the masculine uh, is associated with a respect for the law and the feminine with a willingness to defy the prohibition of the law. If woman Eve is supposed to be partly redeemed by the Virgin Mary, and this is not as far-fetched as it sounds since that the four characters in Evelina are Call, are named after the Virgin Mary, Mary Mervyn, and the three Pollies. Uh, Polly being a diminutive of Molly, which is the short form of Mary. Too. Um, so if Eve is supposed to be redeemed by the Virgin Mary, whose obedience to the law of the Father, um, uh, she says, I will, uh, uh, whose obedience to the law of the Father reverses Eve's fault, centuries of theological writings have so dehumanized the Virgin by depriving her of everything that could associate her with a real-life woman, that she has, in fact, become the exception confirming the general rule of women as sinners, as the title of Marina Warner's book on the cult of the Virgin Mary states it, she is alone of all our sex. So in such a context, how could a little Eve possibly dream of bringing her father to justice? And yet... Bernie's novel, while acknowledging all this, and there's no rebellion against this, uh, wh why else all these blushes? Why would Evelina feel so guilty all the time and ashamed? Bernie's novel subtly turns the myth upon its head and lays, lays it bare, and exposes it for what it is, a myth. Evelina, again, does not take issue, or directly, um, with the conception that women are outlaws by definition. It does not call for women to become lawmakers, or at least not directly, Mrs. Selwyn being a slightly uh, you know, difficult case to, 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 to deal with. It does not call for women to take part directly in the public sphere of the law. But it suggests that being an outlaw, disobeying the rules, is not necessarily a sin, a sign of guilt, a bad thing. Uh, it does so on a diegetic, but mostly on a narrative level. Finally, trusting her own judgment instead of Vilus's, Evelina dares to disobey the father judge's prohibition, thou shalt not speak with Orville, and yet she does. She dares to question Vilus's judgment regarding Orville, and she is amply rewarded and not punished for it. It is Evelina and not Maria or Polly Green who marries splendidly, uh, leaving Miss Mervyn in quest of a husband, divine or otherwise. But, uh, Bernie depicts her little Eve's triumph in a novel where the two characters, who happen to be lawmakers, Lovell and Lord Merton, who is, as Mrs. Selwyn re reminds us, a senator of the nation, where these two characters are portrayed as either ridiculous or entirely disagreeable, and they are clearly condemned by the narrative and openly mocked by Mrs. Selwyn, a mere woman, if not by Evelina herself. It is true that Bernie's heroine cannot too strongly stress her attachment to law and order, deploring the lack of discipline in the Brenton family, for instance, and dutifully considering a child's submission to her father as one of, I quote, the laws of nature. Nevertheless, here as in so many other aspects, Evelina's narrative is at odds with Evelina's words, 
since disorder keeps erupting into the fabric of the novel, like a monkey in an upper-class lady's polished parlour. Evelina's world is not a regulated one, established, fixed, determined, set. The young Brantons are undisciplined, but they are not punished. They do not amend. Nor does Captain Mervyn, nor does the ungovernable, disorderly Madame Duval, who remains unabashed. Uh, Mervyn's monkey intervenes five pages before the end of Evelina at a point in the novel's economy where stability should be reached, order established, uh, uh, and this delays the restoration of order until the last possible moment. Like this monkey, throughout Evelina, Mervyn, Duval, even the Brantons upset what should be set, fixed, established, and regulated by the norms of society. The fact that Mervyn disguises himself as an outlaw uh, is significant. Uh, um, they do so from a diegetic and from a linguistic point of view, since their idioms jar with the standard uh, speech of Lady Howard and Villers. They provide Bernie's writing with a comic energy which distinguishes her novel. To put it differently, the unruly... Uh, unlawful maybe, unruly elements of Evelina do not submit to a triumphant law of fiction writing or poetic justice which could, would give everyone their due. Evelina's own disobedience, slight as it is, uh, is a sign that the refusal to abide by the rules is not necessarily to be considered as negative, as sinful, and it is mirrored by the feminine Orville, so it's not that feminine, but he, that's a word which uh, students know is used to uh, describe him too. It, it is mirrored by Orville's reluctance to determine early on, it's uh, uh, the last quote on your handout, uh, I will not pretend to determine, um, and, and more strikingly uh, later, by his refusal to follow the rules of reason which stipulate that a rich and eligible young man ought to know as much as he can about a girl's background before proposing. And the novel proves them both right in disregarding what may or may not be done to return to the definition of the law uh, uh, quoted earlier. Suggesting, I would argue to conclude, that feminine transgression of the law may be just as important as masculine law abidingness in Evelina, but perhaps less openly so, and something which the history of Evelina's writing and publication seems to confirm as Bernie felt she had to hide from her own father for the actual writing of the novel, fearing, and probably wrongly, his disapproval. And Margaret Doody thinks that um, Dr. Bernie, in fact, had nothing against novels, and that Bernie had to construe her father as being hostile to the form of fiction she wanted to write. Um, so uh, she felt, Bernie felt that she had to be an outlaw, as it were, in order to write evincing the inherently transgress transgressive nature of fiction writing, although she could not entirely <coughs> do away with a sense of guilt. Um, and after which, she asked for her father's blessing and obtained his sanction to publish, without his reading her book, remaining within the bounds of the paternal law, stealing her cake and lawfully eating it too. Thank you.